Hi, and welcome to this part two of our little quickie number 21 that's all about repairing a broken drill press. Well, repairing, not too sure about that. What we're actually doing is making a replacement part. So here is the original part and here's the replacement part that we're making. And we can see by looking at this that the boss on both parts are the same size, but that the diameter of the end and thusly its height is quite a bit smaller than the replacement part that I'm making. So first thing we want to do here is mill a flat on each end of the part on its diameter. So two flats uh, to bring this part down to the same height as the original part. Now I can hear the neurons popping out there and you're probably saying, well, why didn't you just turn the outside diameter of the part down to the same height as the original part? And that would have been problem solved. And you're right, it would have solved this problem. The clearance between the part and the table, height-wise. But it creates two other problems. Now, if I turn the diameter down, well, I'm going to be missing material. And we'll see why in a few minutes. But the second reason that it's important to create flats on this part rather than turn it down to the same height as the other one, well, is that the flats give me something to refer back to. Once I bore the large hole into this part, a hole that's going to measure about 1 inch 850 thousandths, well, I'm going to have to be able to refer the part in X, Y, and Z for operations that come after, such as the uh, production of the two screw holes that are going to hold all this together at the end. And that is very difficult to do on a completely cylindrical part. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to make my life simpler. I'm just going to create two flats. And that means that I can always come back to the perpendicular uh, surface from the axis of that bore that I'm making. Just makes lining things up a lot easier. Now, the second reason is the two screws in the end. I'm using, uh, I'm going to be using two socket head cap screw 3 8 16 to hold the back to the front once I've split the part in two. And that means that three inch diameter minus the bore that's going through it that measures one inch 850 thousandths of an inch that's going to leave me with 1 inch 150 thousandths of an inch of material uh, overall that's left, not including the hole that's in the part. So divide by 2 because the hole's going to be in the middle, and that leaves 575 thousandths of an inch per side. Now, 575 thousandths of an inch per side means that a 3 8 16 socket head cap screws head is just going to make it here. Those heads me measure about 560 thousandths of an inch. So that would mean that I'm going to be just a few thousandths of an inch shy of being flush with the edge on the inside, which is what I want. I don't want the head of this screw to be protruding out the side of the part. But had I reduced the diameter down to the same height as the original part, well, those screw heads would be protruding quite a bit, and I don't want that. Well, first things first, and since we're going to be working in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, well, we're going to want to align our vise. Now, I'm not going to explain the whole process here, because we already have a video that covers the subject. And here's the name of that video, and where you can find it. So. As you can see, I have my milling cutter installed here, and I've lowered the head quite a bit. Now why would I do that? You must remember that rigidity is important when milling, okay? And to maintain maximum rigidity, well, I want the quill to extend the least possible uh, from the head of the machine. The, the closer, the higher up the quill is in the machine, once properly locked down, well, the more rigid the installation is going to be, and that's important for milling. 
Uh, what are we going to be doing here? Well, we're going to bring this cutter down to the surface of the part with the cutter in rotation. Very important never to approach a part with a cutter that is not turning. So in rotation I'm going to come and just barely touch off the top of this part. Then I'm going to set my uh, collar to zero and I'm going to feed down half of the amount that I have to take off because I'm going to be taking off half on the top and half on the bottom. Uh, but how much do I have to take off? So what we want here is the difference between this part's diameter and the height of this part here. Now we know this part is three inches in diameter and here's a little trick. I set my, and this works with digital or dial calipers, I set my calipers to three inches, which is the diameter of my aluminum part. I'm going to zero that there, and then I'm going to unlock and measure the other part. And there we have 316 thousandths of an inch. So that's the difference between the two parts. But I want to take a bit off the top and a bit off the bottom. So that'll be 316 thousandths of an inch divided by 2. And that gives me 158 thousandths of an inch. So 158 off the top, 158 off the bottom. Now, before we set up for this cut, one last thing that needs to be mentioned. The gravity around here goes that way. And that means that the spindle on this machine tends to fall that way. And that can be problematic because this is a neutral uh, faced cutting uh, tool. And that means that when it cuts, it's not going to be pulled down, it's going to be pushed up. So when I feed down here, I want the force of my feed to be pushing in that direction to counteract the cutting force in that direction. In other words, and another way of saying it is I don't want the looseness or the play in the feed drive here to come and wreak havoc on my dimensions. So what I'm going to do is every time I move vertically down a little more, I'm going to loosen my spindle lock, but I'm never going to untighten it completely. I want to maintain a reasonable amount of friction on the spindle so that it doesn't just fall on its own and screw up my dimensions and that is quite important so let's take this cut we're actually going to be cutting it in two passes i think or i think we'll see how it cuts but the first pass will be 100 thousandths of an inch in depth and probably two or three passes in width and then we'll go down to our final depth so that'll be a 58 thousandths of an inch second cut so let's do that so, with my spindle lock snug but loose enough to permit movement, I'm going to come with the cutter in rotation and just skim the top of this part. I can now set my collar to zero and adjust the depth of my first cut to one hundred thousandths of an inch, which is one full turn. There we go. Lock everything down. Okay, so we're going to be uh, turning about 1400 RPM here and we're going to maintain a good stiff feed. We don't want to micro feed this and try and get a mirror finish. It never works and especially not with aluminum. We want a good feed. We want our chips to form properly. Also, and it's important to mention that I'm going to be milling in a conventional milling style. Okay, I'm not going to climb mill here. Now, conventional milling means that the rotation of the tool is going to push against the feed of the parts, so or the parts feeding into the rotation. And that is by far the least efficient way of milling. 
but it is by far the safest way of milling. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, if you want more information about speeds and feeds, well, here's a couple of videos that you might want to look at. And, well, for us, let's start cutting. Note that I'm snugging up the X and Y axis here, not locking them, snugging them. And that is going to reduce vibration. I can do this without damaging my machine because this machine uses tapered gibs and the locks push up against the gibs, not against the ways of the table. If, however, your machine uses cam locks, that push directly onto the ways of the machine, while well, this technique of snugging up should be avoided. Now, I'm at my 158 thousandths of an inch, and that is the depth that I wanted. But when I flip my part over, this is the top of the second side. So all I have to do here to set my second side for starting my cuts is to bring this back to zero without moving my hand wheel. Lock that in place, and I'm ready to start my depth cuts on the second side.
And there we have our part, same height as the original. And that means that we're ready to move on to the drilling and the boring of that 1 inch 850 thousandths of an inch hole. But before we do that, we have a little bit of deburring to do and some measuring to do. Here's what I have to figure out here. Now, my table has a hole in it. And I want to maintain the proper distance between this hole and the column of the machine. And that position is determined by the link here. And we can see that this surface, I'm not really worried about this, that'll be whatever it'll be. But from this edge here to the center of the hole, that's where I want to find, because that's where I'm going to want to transfer to my part here to get the bore in the proper position. So, how am I going to do that? Well, we'll measure here. First, we're going to measure our bore here. And that comes out to 1.852. So, 1.852. Now, that's the whole bore. I want half of the bore, just the front half here. So, divide by 2, that gives me 926 plus whatever I have here. So let's measure that here. And here we have 944. So 926 plus uh, 0.944 equals 100, 1 inch 870,000. So 1.870 inches. So that's the dimension we're going to be shooting for next week when we drill and bore that hole. And we'll also be splitting the part and finishing up those two uh, threaded holes that'll hold all this together once it's done. So until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.